thank you IAB for inviting us uh, to share some of the ideas and, and work that we've done over the past 18, 20 years. Um, we're a small architecture and interior design office uh, studio. Amrish, my director, uh, who's also here, uh, and myself head the office. And we've got a very small team of about 12 people, and uh, sometimes goes up to 15. But we really enjoy this manageable size in the office um, as we uh, are very hands-on in the office as well as our building sites, uh, customizing solutions with uh, contractors, masons, carpenters, and uh, vendors. Uh, the, the office is so structured that it's an old house which has been uh, converted into three floors with my wife's graphic design firm sandwiched between two floors of an architectural office. And the, we have a spiral staircase running uh, as a spine right through the office. And this was very intentional, the spine running through to encourage a flow of ideas uh, between the architects, interior designers, and the graphic designers, a uh, collaborative approach, a cross-disciplinary approach in our work. So there's a constant flow of ideas uh, in the office, and we uh, alternate between various disciplines. This is, uh, apart you know, from the architecture that we practice, there's a lot of uh, uh, interior design work that we're doing. Almost 50% of the work in the office is uh, interior design. And we uh, are doing trendy clubs, bars, restaurants, which sometimes have a low shelf life, uh, need to have a wow factor. And uh, uh, they're quite the opposite from our contemplative uh, architectural spaces. But uh, I think it's really exciting to work on both kinds of projects, uh, because you know one feeds off the other. Both the disciplines feed off each other, adding richness and layers to our work. And uh, it's, it's nice to alternate between these two disciplines. And uh, I'm just going to show you a few snapshots of some of the interior projects before moving on to the architecture, because uh, it really shapes uh, who we are. This is a, a lounge bar in, in, in Hyderabad with a very uninspiring uh, ceiling. This was many years ago, uh, devoid of, of, of any excitement. And what we did was we suspended thousands of meters of chiffon fabric down to the beam bottom, lit it up within from, with LED light. At that time, it was quite a new technology. And preset colors bounce seductively through the fabric onto the rest of the space. And uh, the, the, the space is you know, changed with, with just the, the quality of the light bouncing. So very good exercise in, in just in LED lighting. And in a bar in Kolkata, we suspended a mezzanine structure in, in the space, a floating mezzanine, and we sheathed it entirely in uh, resin. We wanted it to, to distinguish itself from the rest of the space in terms of form, texture, and luminescence. And uh, there it is. It's suspended in its old kind of brick shell, which is the existing uh, shell of the space, a nice contrast with the new and the old. In, in Shiro, a Pan-Asian restaurant, uh, which we did in, in, in Mumbai and Bangalore, high degree of customization, we uh, created, this is a 45 foot high volume, a very exciting volume space in an old mill building. And uh, the entire space is, is local natural stone. And uh, we commissioned uh, 10 young sculptors from Mumbai at, who are adept at making these Ganesha idols at this larger than life scale. And we commissioned them to do all the statuary and friezes in the entire space. At a bar in, uh, uh, in Hyderabad, where various designers were commissioned to design spaces using the Nizam of Hyderabad's jewels as inspiration, we created this highly faceted structure uh, referencing uh, the, the facets of a black diamond, which unpredictably envelopes the entire space. And in the Tao kitchen of a restaurant in Bangalore, we created these trapezoidal uh, wooden uh, void, uh, voids, which 
go into a, a concrete a ceiling grid, creating a warm textural uh, ceiling. And then the graphic designers, my, my wife's firm, uh, Tanya's firm, designed these whimsical art installations uh, right through the space uh, using utilitarian uh, kitchen uh, utensil cutouts. And these are some of the folding screens which pivot and, and uh, the utensils fold. The MTV office, which we did way back in 1998, which it was on a shoestring budget. We uh, did the diametric opposite of a modern corporate interior. And we, this was a nice opportunity for cross-cultural exploration. And we used local film poster artists. Now they're very extinct. You don't see them. You don't see this kind of work in, uh, in, on the streets of Mumbai or Bangalore or anywhere. But these were all, all the, the film poster art. It was all hand painted. And, uh, we used uh, that, uh, you know, we, we got these artists to paint on the walls. And recently, Amrish, Tanya, and myself have designed a nice set of furniture. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's an object. We're trying to explore the idea of, of uh, making a set of objects and furniture out of uh, taking inspiration from type. In this case, it is a hybrid font called Kari, which was designed by Tanya. And we have integrated typography into furniture. And uh, so there's an element of fun, as the previous speaker says, in all our work. Uh, there is an you know, element of thinking out of the box. And uh, there is a certain, uh, you know, there's an exploration of context, of course, in our work, in our interior and architecture work that runs right through. There's, it links our work uh, quite strongly, but also there is uh, the aspect of telling stories through our work. And uh, there's a narrative quality to our work and a progression of spaces, especially a set of experiences unfold much like uh, the pages of an interesting book, from visually uh, quiet to bold and graphic pages. For me, the exploration of architectural discourse uh, or the introduction to it was at the Pratt Institute undergraduate program, where I was, I was introduced to a variety of methodologies and complex abstract exercises in the making of form. Uh, my inspiring professors like Raymond Abraham, Gamal el Zogbi, and Hanford Yang were architectural thinkers, but not practitioners. So the work, although conceptually sophisticated, was removed from, from aspects of of materiality, climate, context, and culture. When I returned to India, I worked with Charles Correa, and then I visited other architects in the subcontinent, like Jeffrey Bawa. I understood the importance of voids, of open to sky spaces, the blurring of boundaries between built form and the exterior natural environment, the importance of verandas and courtyards. This really chartered a way forward for the work I wanted to practice, one that was respectful of history, of tradition, and that's my own house, uh, the, of history, tradition, and climate, and context, but was innovative and modern. And also, we are now designing spaces uh, holistically uh, with a very a kind of a blurring, a vanishing of boundaries between architecture, interior design, and the landscape. I'll now show a few uh, architectural projects. This was way back uh, when we just started one of the first houses, a certain typology of home, which takes cues from, uh, from colonial uh, architecture of the region and vernacular slope roofs. It's very climate sensitive. All these spaces are the permeable spaces, open to sky courtyards, verandas, uh, so that the space really breathes. And we have uh, a double layer of clay tiles, uh, underside clay, uh, Kerala tiles, and a Manglo tile roof to keep the roof uh, uh, space cool and to slope off the rains. So they're tiled walkways, verandas. This is the sole or the hub of the house. This was for an English couple who had family ties in, in Bangalore, and they wanted a house with an Indian sole, but a contemporary home. And one has used these 
vertical stone monoliths. This is Bangalore is built on uh, a bed of this wonderful stone, and we use this to secure the house, yet allow for cross ventilation into the courtyard. That's the, that's the detail of the same. In the next house, which is the Fernandez house, this was on a, on a smaller plot. The previous one was on a 9,000, uh, on a one acre plot. This is just about a 10,000 square foot plot, but large requirements of uh, seven bedrooms, a basement for car parks, a swimming pool, all that kind of stuff. The, uh, this was interesting because the neighbors actually had violated and built very, very close to the wall on the north and the east side. And the only lung space was really on the southwestern side, and which is against the uh, Vastu principles, I have to say, but I'll come to that later. Uh, but there was a large shady rain tree uh, on the southwestern corner, and we designed the house as an L shape, looking, out, looking into, that, into that lung space. This is the entrance with uh, these Saad Rali stone uh, uh, steps, uh, ramp going down to the basement. And the steps used, this is our favorite stone, use it as shifting planes going up to the entrance and then further as a, a vertical column. Uh, there are two verandas, deep verandas to protect against the south uh, sun, the fair south sun. Um, and there are bedrooms on both levels that open out into the veranda. They are very, you know, very well ventilated. This is a very exciting a uh, uh, little detail of uh, vertical columns, uh, you know, carved out of the local Quera stone, but they have steel diagonal arms from the Kerala tile roofs, diagonally shifting the load down to the base. And uh, Amrish works uh, very, very closely on all these details uh, in the house, which really add a layer of richness to the projects that we do. And they're contrasting textures with all our stone, uh, the, the lime green slate, local Sadhrali stone, Kota stone. So we have an empathy to use uh, local materials and finishes. That's a how, the view in the, at night. And the next house, Vastu house, I call it the Vastu house because the client was, this is a 20,000 square foot plot. The client was very, very particular that all the spaces had to be in strict accordance to the principles of Vastu. That means the placement uh, according to the energies of the Vastu Purush Mandala. And, uh, but other than that, he said, you have complete freedom aesthetically on how to interpret it. But this was a, a huge challenge, really, because uh, you know, to design a house with a contemporary sensibility, with a very, very rigid program that dictated the position not only of the southwestern master bedroom, the uh, kitchen to the, uh, to the southeast, the north uh, swimming pool, and the water elements, the water elements in, I think I've skipped too far, yeah. So the water element in the north and the northeast, and so that's the south, the kitchen of the east, southeast, north, northeast. But also, it, the program dictated the number of risers on the staircase, the position of the WCs, the cupboard locations, the desk locations, the swing of the doors. So we could, we could have just given up at that point and said, forget it. But I think we took it on as a challenge. And it, it has worked out to be quite a wonderful project. The, the site is uh, grown with you know, very tall trees, and the house weaves itself around the site and ascends lazily from the northeast to the southwest and centers itself in this uh, kind of intimate courtyard. And a lot of the spaces around the courtyard, uh, you know, the boundaries get completely blurred between the dining and the courtyard, for example. The next house uh, is on a coconut plantation in a fishing village in near Trivandrum, uh, south of Kovalam. And uh, uh, the client wanted a, 
a home to just enjoy the sea. Uh, he's an Ayurveda uh, enthusiast. That is the kind of location we were given, a cliff with a 200-foot drop into a front of coconut plantation, beach, and the Arabian Sea. So very, very exciting uh, first glance at the site. And what we decided was, this is the site, and we decided on this one-acre site to locate the house on the southwestern edge, uh, overlooking the cliff, of course, to take care of that you know, beautiful panorama of a view. And this was the first gesture, which was really an emotive response to the site, a skewed uh, concrete wall, sheer wall, 45 meters long, suspending, uh, supporting a lightweight triangulated canopy roof. And that is a section of the uh, wall and that roof which kind of really lunges out towards the view. And so we kept this 180 degree panorama uh, constantly in mind while designing the house, of course. And uh, the, we imagined how the, the skewed wall and the roof would really bring in the sea, the air, and the breezes right into the house, welcome it right into the house. So it is climate sensitive, the house, because on the western side, this is where the monsoons really come. This is a very, very large overhang which kind of protects the house. But the rest of the house is actually quite intelligently permeable. It's uh, you know, only 1,400, uh, half of the 1,400 square meter area is actually concealed or you know, divided by, uh, is enclosed by four walls. The rest are kept quite open. We, we chose to have large framing openings towards the view to allow the you know, seasonal breezes to penetrate right through. The movement is from the northeast to southwest. Uh, you enter the house, you come into a large open voluminous foyer which divides the private bedrooms from some of the public areas, the living, the kitchen, and the servants' areas. And uh, on the upper level, there's a walkway with further bedrooms. So that's the movement right through and into the infinity pool. And the sea breezes move in the opposite direction from the southwest to the northeast, and they are able to also penetrate right through the house. So that's the coconut plantation on the northeast, and you still see that. Uh, and you see filtered views of the house, and then uh, through a, a monolithic stone steps uh, flanked by these tropical water bodies, you enter the, enter the house, and this is, at the entrance, there's a mysterious slatted wooden screen, which uh, we intentionally chose to have the, this entrance and the, uh, this, the front entrance and the rear entrance to be quite contrasting. One conceals and the other kind of embraces the view. And uh, so you enter, the, uh, enter this uh, large volume of foyer uh, flanked by uh, rooms on either side. And then there's a meditation deck and a walkway on the upper level with a staircase. And this moves on to the, uh, finally, into the infinity pool. And this is a large pool uh, which kind of compensates for some of the mi missing beach access because this is at, at a very high level. And, uh, there are these kind of wonderful open spaces, just covered by roof, but open from the sides uh, of you know, dining and reading uh, and you know, contemplation. And it's the kind of spaces that we like to promote in a lot of our houses, uh, spaces that spill out, are close to nature, but at the same time you know, are not enclosed by four walls. Because we have been working in the belt, especially in Bangalore, there's a temperate, wonderful climate. In Kerala, there's a great tradition of carpentry skills, and uh, it's evident in a lot of the uh, old palaces and houses of the region. And we sat down with the uh, carpenters and devised these wonderful sliding folding louvered shutters. So we, these are the sliding folding louvered shutters. So there's absolutely no glass in the entire house. Glass would have trapped the heat in Kerala, uh, and large expanses of glass would have just turned it, turned it into a hothouse. Uh, rather, we devised these sliding and folding louver shutters, which allow the breezes to come right through. They can be modulated and, or opened up completely to let the 
uh, views in. And the furniture, the interior design is very, very simple. There's polished cement on the floors, simple teak furniture, uh, not to distract from the views. And uh, the bathrooms are connected uh, by courts. They're open to the sky and the shower areas, and they're connected back into the rooms visually. We designed a school, uh, uh, an arts and media center. We, we won a competition to design uh, this for the Dune School, a premier all-boys boarding school. It also happens to be my alma mater, a place that also nurtured my own creativity as a student. So it was very close to my heart, this project. And uh, this, uh, the, the site is at the foothills of the Himalayas uh, in a valley, uh, home to the Forest Research Institute. Uh, and so it has these towering, tall, and rare trees. Um, but, you know, life for the boys is fairly monastic, disciplined, even though a lot of them come from privileged backgrounds. Art has also played a very central role in a Dune School education. And when the, uh, when the school commissioned us to do this project, they wanted us, they wanted a very strong statement of intent to have us uh, put the building in the center of the campus really at the physical crossroads of the campus, uh, flanking a landscape, uh, large landscape garden, the main iconic main building, a bakery building to the west, and an old aqueduct to the, uh, to the south. So this would really complete the entire quadrangle of uh, the main school quadrangle. And conceptually, the, uh, the axis running east-west, we saw that as the journey of the, of the artist running right through the, uh, the building and dissolving into the landscape garden. There are two buildings, one for art instruction, uh, painting, ceramic, and sculpture studios, and the other uh, has a film studio, a lecture hall, publications room, and display galleries. And they're connected by this bridge, uh, which links the, this internal bridge. The uh, internal spaces have a six meter wide uh, double level uh, gallery uh, connecting both, uh, both buildings. And this, this gallery leads into the functional requirements of the art department, all the studio spaces, uh, et cetera. From the, from the outside, the building is a, is a sculptural mass of varying texture and material. Uh, there is brick, which is uh, which was a mandate because the rest of the architecture of the campus is brick. So there was, uh, there was, we had to put some amount of brick in the building. But there's, there's wire cut brick and corrugated metal sheets emerging from a spine of yellow slate. These are all kind of easily and locally sourced materials from, from around that region. And this is the quality of the interior spaces. Just very simple north light coming into the galleries to the entire space so that you don't uh, really require too much artificial light during the day. So really a very simple approach. The, the east-west axis was used so that you had skylights right across the building. So that's the quality of light coming into the gallery spaces. The painting studios are bright uh, on top. They lead out into terraces. And then also the studios on the lower level all open out into their own courtyard. So a lot of the activity energy of the studios comes out into the courtyards. So the building is, is contextual also as, it, as it, uh, it is juxtaposed with this iconic 100-year-old uh, uh, main school building. And it also, uh, topograph topographically, it just uh, does not, it preserves all the old trees of the campus. We never we didn't take out any trees. We tried to also accommodate them in the building design. And the materiality is uh, the, the stone is redolent of the nearby mountains. Uh, the brick resonates with the other brick architecture of the campus. And the corrugated metal is in harmony with the uh, trees around. And this is the main axis, east-west, which uh, reinforced, it reinforces the 
main building axis and the aqueduct axis. It also preserves three very important pedestrian pathways running from the north to the south of the campus. And under that bridge, this is one of those main pedestrian pathways which lead to the entrance of both those buildings. Uh, we consulted with the Energy and Resource Institute to try and see in a, in a sensible way how to uh, keep the temperatures within between 16 and 27 degrees. And so the courtyard spaces, they have indirect light coming in, filtered light right through the north light system. There are large overhangs on the, on the west and the uh, south uh, to protect against the heat. And uh, that's how the light kind of emerges into the, into, into, into the entire space. Just the last uh, couple of projects. This is a house in Hubli. Uh, in North Karnataka. Uh, this was the first visual of that house. You know, up, apart from the, the structure, these were these old trees, the Gulmohar trees, which flower with these red flowers. There were peacocks strutting around this, uh, in this one acre plot. And we wanted to do a kind of an architecture which was very much in harmony with the surroundings. And there were very few programmatical requirements uh, of, of the client and who wanted very large rambling spaces. So it made sense to do a kind of a single level home uh, with vernacular uh, clay tiled roofs and which would be very much in harmony with the surroundings. So as you uh, come into the entrance portico from the northeast, this is also a house which is strictly uh, done according to the uh, to Vastu. And you come into a imposing red laterite wall. This is, again, the local stone of that area. It alternates between laterite and uh, sadrali gray uh, uh, granite. And behind this imposing wall is uh, a beautiful 3,000 square feet open core courtyard. And the bedrooms flank the courtyard, as well as a 12-foot wide uh, tiled walkway, veranda, which surrounds it. So there's a very interesting dialogue between the built form here, the veranda, and this open space. And that's what we really proposed, was this wonderful dialogue between both the spaces. And the veranda becomes this wonderful fluid container uh, for contemplation, for reading, writing, dining. And uh, the landscape also played a very crucial role in this project to establish this connection between the indoors and the outdoors. And really, the vanishing of some of these lines, that's the dining space, but the outdoor uh, garden, and then on this side, facing a courtyard. And then at the, uh, at the rear, there are the bedrooms, which open out into their own private courts. Uh, the bathrooms do the same. A school that is an ongoing project in Bangalore, and now we are kind of shifting scale really from the design in our interior projects from small objects uh, to large institutional buildings. Institutional buildings is not something that we are really used to doing, uh, and this is really a first foray into that. But uh, we are finding it interesting because we've been working in the luxury segment for so long with unlimited budgets that suddenly uh, to do a school uh, at a low cost budget is, is quite exciting. The client wanted to, this is part of a larger master plan of, uh, of a school for 4,000 students. And uh, it's a Delhi public school franchisee. Uh, uh, and, but the client is very well known to us but, and was kind of one of the houses early on was her house. And this, uh, is the first block, a kindergarten block that we had to put up. The challenge was, apart from, over, of course, providing uh, natural, you know, a lot of light and ventilation in the space and a cheerful ambience for, this was a kindergarten block. We had to uh, create the project in a very, very short span of time. Five to six months was the time given for 40,000 square feet at a cost of 1,200 rupees a square foot, no more. So, Really, the choices in this project were really born out of these necessities. 
that we really had to do this in a very, very efficient modular way. So what we did was we took a module of 700 square feet, a 35 feet by 20 feet classroom, and we repeated it along a 8 foot wide corridor facing a large courtyard, uh, which would allow the air and light in, and cross ventilation this way through the entire courtyard. So that's the axis running uh, uh, east-west. And uh, that's the kind of repetition of classrooms. The entire school was done in an RCC construction. Uh, no plastering on the walls or the ceiling to cut costs. And we used this corrugated metal sheet on the corridors to save on costs as well as to put the construction up quite fast. And these are the quality of the courtyard spaces. The corrugated sheets also allowed us to play with different colors and patterns so that we could make the space quite cheerful. And uh, this was complete in five months, uh, five and a half months, this 40,000 square foot block. The kids went in at the right time. And uh, it was a very rewarding project uh, under a lot of constraints. And it's also a model that needs to be kind of replicated into different schools for the same franchises. So we wanted to keep it quite efficient, sensible, modular, a lot of light and air. We have used all kinds of jalis, vertical and horizontal jalis, and these uh, wonderful vernacular local terracotta jalis, which, uh, which uh, kind of give filtered light into the entire space. And that's the way the sea breeze is. The jali is actually uh, on the exterior. It also is on, in the classrooms. And the sea breeze, uh, the, uh, sorry, the breezes just flow right through the classroom. So they're very well ventilated. And that's how it kind of wraps around. So the context really uh, shift in our work as we are uh, shifting typologies, changing typologies in our work, and are also moving from, from uh, small objects, alternating between small objects and large institutional buildings. But hopefully, we can always find some level of innovation and uh, adventure in our work uh, so that, uh, and in, in time to come. Thank you. <laughs>